Hi there. My name is Gleb Smirnov. I'm working at the Nginx, and we are working in tight cooperation with our partner Netflix. And together, together we are working on uh, their Netflix content delivery network. And every day we make it faster and more efficient than it was yesterday. The CDN is based on open source technologies, the FreeBSD operating system, and the Nginx web server in the first place. Uh, and my today talk, uh, today I'd like to talk on how we build it, uh, how we run the network, and how we benefit from using the open source, and how does the open source benefits from us using it. Uh, I think here probably everyone knows what Netflix is. Uh, just in case, if you don't know, it's a, a video on demand streaming service. And I'd like to show you some numbers to show how actually the big the service is. So we've got 50 million subscribers. This actually are not, that doesn't mean 50 million people. It means more because one subscriber is usually a household. Um, most of the subscribers are in the United States. But apart from the United States, we're already running in more than 40 countries. And these countries are rapidly growing markets. Uh, the Netflix video collection consists of over one petabyte of data, and every byte of this data is available on demand. Right now, you can watch it. Speaking of the US, USA, we are the traffic generator number one in North America, and we recover more than one third of all downstream traffic. Uh, I think this is impressive. And now let's look how this enormous traffic generator works inside. Uh, here is the basic layout of uh, the components of the Netflix video streaming. Uh, we run all the complex stuff in the Amazon cloud. This includes the business logic, uh, our data mining, encoding of videos, recording them, resizing, encrypting. Uh, <clears throat> the actual video streaming is also started by the Amazon. So the client logins on the website, authenticates itself, and then uh, the cloud controls its operation. But all the bulk video data, uh, the actual data that constitutes that one third of internet that I have just showed you, is uh, served by a content delivery network. Uh, when Netflix started its <coughs> instant video streaming service, initially uh, we outsourced the content delivery to the big three CDNs, the level three, Akamai and Limelight, but uh, as online video service had grown in its popularity, uh, the amount of traffic sort also grown rapidly, faster than the CDNs could build themselves up, and soon it was clear that delivering over the internet, the, the video delivery over the internet is the principal activity of the Netflix, that uh, we are no longer a company that ships DVDs, we are post. We are a video streaming company. And if this is a pr principal activity, we probably should not outsource it. Uh, there is no, uh, there's actually a number of reasons. And the first reason I already mentioned is we, we need to grow faster and CDNs can't, go, can, can't keep the pace. And of course, this amount of traffic being outsourced, it is very expensive. And running our own CDN, we will reduce costs. Uh, except for these two obvious reasons, what are the other reasons to build our own CDN? Uh, the first, it's about the control of the video streaming. So video streaming has like simplified three components. The video player of the user uh, that connects to the web server, this one, the web server itself, that's two, and the internet in between them. Ideally, we want to control all this stuff. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> uh, at least we want to control the ends of this chain, the, the client and the server. We already control the client because all the players are developed in the Netflix. Uh, and uh, in this chain, uh, client, internet, server, there are plenty of things that can go wrong. And video streaming is very sensitive to packet loss, round trip time jitter, 
uh, delays and uh, all kind of internet anomalies. If uh, <coughs> the player uh, experiences some problems, it reports this problem to the control server, and uh, we want to uh, fix them. We, we, we want uh, early detection of problems uh, and clients being rerouted to other servers, and uh, we also won't be able to log in into these servers and uh, look from, in, from, the, uh, from the inside what's wrong. So, in short, we want to control the server side. Um, uh, controlling the server side also allows us a possibility, uh, gives us possibility to run uh, our specific TCP conjunction uh, uh, control algorithms uh, to run some sp special HTTP models and so on. Uh, and of course, uh, this, uh, this all means that we are building a specialized CDN, not a generic one that can serve anything, but the CDN that can serve our video. And of course, a specialized product, it works better than, uh, than a generic one. Uh, and finally, uh, we want to make our CDN spread around the uh, countries and put the content closer to clients to reduce all these mentioned uh, internet anomalies. And the answer to all these uh, reasons is Open Connect. So what is Open Connect? Uh, we want to spread our caches throughout the internet and put them close to clients. And thus, what we do is that we, we offer ISPs our caches for free uh, so that ISP can install our cache uh, into their own rack, and this cache will be dedicated for serving uh, the video content to the network customers that are connected to this ISP. Uh, look here. Uh, this is actually a triple win situation. So uh, the ISP reduces uh, the load on its outer links by one third. Uh, the clients get better connection to the video and thus better movie watching quality. And we, Netflix, we gain all the stuff that I mentioned on the previous slide. Uh, unfortunately, not all ISPs uh, accepted this offer. So in some places, we need to install uh, uh, caches of our own at points of large internet exchange uh, in attempt to improve streaming quality for their uh, customers that are connected to the ISPs that were unlucky to, to not accept the Open Connect initiative. <laughs> uh, technically, these AX caches, they differ from the ISP ones only in configuration of routing. Um, how do these caches look like? So on this slide, I just put a photo of one of the first caches. We call them Open Connect appliances. The core idea of building the appliance is that we push as much terabytes as possible into one unit of rack space. Uh, originally, that was a custom chassis of four units in height, and uh, it was painted in a corporate red color, and we also put uh, quotes from classical movies under them. And this is one of my favorites. Uh, Unfortunately, we no longer paint them red because some ISPs say that they prefer neutral gray and white colors on their racks. <laughs> but we may revise that, however. Okay, let's turn this thing upside down and look what's inside there. There are a lot of disks. So, uh, we, right now we've got uh, two versions of the Open Connect appliance. The first one is full of spinning disks, the one on this slide. Uh, and it, ex it also has a few extra solid state drives for the most popular content. Uh, it carries 144 terabytes of data in it. That means it can carry a, a large part of the entire Netflix collection. Uh, the other version, the SSD box, uh, consists of only SSDs. It's one unit in height, and uh, in carry, it can carry 10 times less 
but at the same time, it can generate more gigabits of traffic per second. So it is used for storing the most popular part of the collection. Uh, these uh, appliances versions, or how we call them, revisions, are uh, wrote and revised like a couple of times per year. Uh, and we are picking more modern hardware for them. Uh, we usually uh, choose the disks of the maximum available volume at the moment. Uh, but we do, we do not go uh, for crochets in the most expensive CPU or the main board. Uh, there is no reason to do that because we usually are not CPU bound, but disk bound or network bound. And if we are CPU bound, we actually would uh, better in, invest into the improving the code rather than in purchasing the most expensive CPU. Uh, we actually do count money when we choose hardware. For example, uh, we started to buy the 40, uh, 40 uh, gigabit NICs only uh, after these cards became more cheap than a set of four 10 gigabit cards. And now for the software. What's there inside of Open Connect appliance? <clears throat> the core components, as, as already mentioned, is the FreeBSD operating system and the Nginx web server. There is also the bird routing daemon that runs BGP. Uh, to in install the software on the appliance, we do not use uh, any regular or usual installation procedures. Instead, we build uh, nano BSD images. Uh, we call them firmwares. Uh, the firmware consists of all things required for the Open Connect operation. It's an uh, operating system kernel, utilities, package of Nginx, all additional modules for Nginx that we run, uh, broad package, scripting languages, uh, uh, all our internal scripts, and finally all configuration files. We've got only the framework to, for annotated upgrade and rollback of firmwares. So to upgrade or roll back a firmware on a certain appliance, it's actually a one-click operation. And why did we choose these software components to be used in the Open Connect? Uh, as the Open Connect project started, it was uh, at the very beginning clear that we are going to push the limits and work on getting more and more gigabits per second from a single box. And thus, we needed to start with an open source product that we actually can modify. And since we give away the appliances to ISPs, and that means that there is involvement of third party, and although we give it for free, still uh, we need them to be BSD licensed because GPL uh, is tricky in the legal area when uh, it comes to the giving away to the third party. Uh, and why exactly FreeBSD? We chose it since it is known to be a good platform to build in an internet server. Even unmodified, it runs fast and stable, and that's a good ground to start with. Uh, the second important key point is that uh, the FreeBSD is, has a very nice community to work with, willing to cooperate with the vendors, and uh, that is actually what we need if we are going to work on improvements to, to the to the sources. Uh, for the web server, no surprise, the best one is Nginx. <laughs> uh, again, same arguments. It is fast and stable out of the box, and we wanted to launch Open Connect as fast as possible. And uh, Nginx is somewhat unique. Uh, I think everyone here knows it, that it's open source BSD license product. and. At the same time, all its developers are working uh, full-time employees as a leg of a legal body, and this legal body offers a super commercial support for the product. That's somewhat unique, and it's a actually a combination of, uh, of the, the most beneficial things of open source and the commercial software at one, at one piece of software. Uh, what is also very important for Netflix video streaming is the uh, flexible framework for the custom models, because we've got a couple of models that are specific to video streaming. And the last throw in the scales is that how Nginx and FreeBSD cooperate together. When running on FreeBSD, Nginx is driven by the BSD-specific advanced KQ event notification system. 
uh, one of the best uh, <coughs> APIs to multiplex I.O. And also out of the box, uh, without any extra efforts, Nginx on FreeBSD would use special trick of using send file system call together with, together with asynchronous read system call. And uh, this trick, it prevents send file to block on disk I.O. Uh, resulting in outstanding performance. Um, this is just uh, a random day from a random Open Connect appliance in this October. Uh, this, this is a, a type, typical uh, day traffic. Uh, you can notice a peak traffic uh, in the evening reaching uh, 20 gigabits per second. Um, yeah, this is evening because the, the horizontal axis is in UTC. Uh, in the night, the traffic goes down and the box switches to the filling mode when it uh, s stops serving the data and it starts to renew its own collection, pulling new titles from the origin server. This uh, small negative peak is actually the filling. Uh, then we've got a tiny peak in the breakfast time, and then during the day the traffic goes up, up to the evening. Uh, we we do the uh, filling window uh, because uh, simultaneous writes and reads to the SSDs uh, give a penalty on the I/O time, so we try to either read from SSDs or write to SSDs. Uh, some uh, details on the how the streaming goes on. We usually serve up to 30,000 of TCP connections per appliance, um, which, uh, and the clients request data in quite small chunks, usually around 100 kilobytes, which is quite far from being optimal for the server. And although We've got some popular content. The vast majority of data requested by clients is not found in the operating system memory cache. Uh, so we need to read it from this directly to network. So streaming several tens of gigabytes of traffic per second uh, with such a friendly request pattern is not an easy task. task. Yeah, and the next important topic I would like to speak about today is uh, how we build on top of open source. Here on slide you can see a typical strategy for most large companies, uh, of most large companies on dealing with open source software. So what they do, they grab a stable version, import it into their own repository, and they start to develop a product on top of it. This had been done in many places for many years, and I think that many of you are familiar with this approach. Uh, at first glance, this looks like a good strategy, uh, because you start with a stable version, and it probably have no bugs. Everyone agrees? Okay. <laughs> and uh, you develop your code without any interaction with the community, without wasting time for these jerks who just do not accept your, bar, your patches and so on. And this, of course, saves a lot of time. Uh, and you don't need to synchronize with what they code, uh, neither you need to vindicate your changes to be included in the upstream and so on. Uh, but does it work in the long term? Uh, at Netflix, we think that no, it doesn't work in the long term. Uh, many of Open Connect uh, team members uh, came from different companies. Uh, and which manage their software exactly in this way, and we all independently from each other learn that this is the wrong way to do things. And this is Netflix way. Uh, it's the opposite. We pull the bleeding edge version of software, and we constantly push our changes back. And before I, I go and tell what's good about our way, let's return back to the traditional one and see what is wrong with it. So the traditional approach is based on several myths, and I'm going to dispel them one by one. 
The first one, the first myth is, of course, about development versions being buggy. And I will not argue, of course, they are. Uh, but I will claim that they contain approximately the same uh, amount of bugs per line of code as the stable versions do. Yes, of course, in development versions, there happen a stupid typos and brainos, but these are usually fixed next day. And the concentration of the non-trivial bugs in the, in the stable and development versions are usually the same. Uh, those who do not believe me, I you can suggest to do the following. Uh, you take a look in the bug tracker of uh, any large open source project. You choose one. Uh, I, for me, I did FreeBSD and I did this. So the bug tracking software it usually allows bug submitters to enter version of the software where they encounter the bug. So what you need to do is to query the database and see how many bugs people discover in development versions and how many they discover in stable versions. So most of bugs are discovered in stable versions. And what this actually means? This means that bugs are discovered only when the code is tried out. And they are not discovered simply because code sits in a repo for several months and ages like a wine. OK, so many people actually already dispelled the first name themselves. And they invented the next one that if we will wait for stable version, someone else will encounter and fix all our bugs. Uh, they believe that if they act like free riders, which is a term from game theory, then they will benefit from others. And um, th when a stable version is to be released, then we'll wait for yet another year uh, and finally try it after a year or so. So I will not go into ethical implications of such approach and that uh, if, all, if everyone act like free riders, that usually yields in the problem named the tragedy of the commons. Instead of these ethical things, I will notice that these people will get an outdated version uh, with the support time reduced by the, for the time period they actually waited for. And finally, their strategy simply doesn't work. Uh, first, uh, there leave some bugs that only you will discover. Uh, if you are doing something more complex than building a personal web page, if you are uh, building a commercial product on top of open source software, you are probably doing something untrivial, and you are about to examine code paths and situations not tested by others. Uh, and the second point is that many open source software used to merge to their stable versions not only security bug fixes and critical bug fixes, but they also merge improvements uh, for performance or new features. And this actually means that they're merging bugs. And this means that waiting for stable version to stabilize means waiting forever. Uh, another important point of early bug discovery compared so late bug discovery is uh, that uh, when you discover a bug in development versions, version, uh, the author of the code is still around. He's working here. The, the code is hot. And it will be fixed quicky, quick, quick, quicker than in the either case. Uh, after a couple of years, the author can just quit the company he worked for, switch to other source project. He can go for a trip around the world, and so on. Even if he's, even if he's still there, uh, there are some uh, unstable versions. There are API and ABI constraints. The overall code completeness and frozenness and fixing bugs takes more time. Uh, and in, in, in case if you report bugs early, you actually not only fix bugs, you influence the actual development of the code. Because you uh, report your uh, real life scenarios to the developer of he, who, who is writing code right now. And probably the resulting code will fit your needs better because you are the early tester. Uh, the next important myth is that uh, about saving time. Of course, following the development version 
uh, working with the open source communities, it all, this all stuff consumes time, consumes time. It is so tempting to cut these expenses and sitting on a version that was initially imported. Unfortunately, experience of numerous companies show that at a certain time in future, you will face a choice of either you do a major upgrade, a big jump in a couple of versions, or your product is dying. Why? Um, simply because uh, when you forked off as open source, you started to uh, improve it in, in the direction you need. You do not cover the entire project and at the same time, um, uh, new, new hardware is released, uh, new protocols are getting common, the internet around you switches to new standards and your code base doesn't support this whole stuff. At, at, certain, at certain point you will also need to handle the security advisories yourself since all the components of your, of your product are no long, longer supported by vendor. So usually upgrade over five years of independent development uh, of upstream will require several months of several experienced developers working only on this upgrade, taking them off their normal developer activities. And here you will pay all the time you saved before and even more. Um, I think that some of you can point me at some exclusions like Apple that took FreeBSD and they made uh, Mac OS 10 of it and they never uh, did complete merges from open source and they just went forward with their own development. Uh, what's different between Apple and you? <laughs> that Apple is actually uh, developing an operating system is their principal activity. They've got developer manpower of the size that is comparable or bigger to the open source community. That's why they, they can run this way. Most companies cannot, so here's the rule of thumb. If uh, your developer manpower is smaller than the open source community you take a product from, then you need to follow the open source. Otherwise, you'll find yourself in a couple of years in an uncomfortable situation. Uh, and the last important myth is about uh, sharing code. That if you uh, disclose your sources, you are disclosing intellectual property. Um, okay, let's look at Netflix. What Netflix does? It provides customers with movies and series and we are not participating in a gigabits per second Olympic competitions. So if we share our know-how on how to improve FreeBSD and Nginx to serve more gigabits of data per second, how would that help our competitors in any way? or if we keep private our bug fixes to open source companies, would that anyhow prevent someone else to fix these bugs? Uh, so that we assert that sharing code uh, that is generic and not closely, tie closely tied to the Netflix video is absolutely safe for our intellectual property. Uh, now that I hope that I convinced you that sharing code is harmless, uh, but is there any benefit in sharing code? Um, usually, rhetorics about the open source, they speak about fairness of giving back. That, like, you take and you should give back, and people who open their code are depicted as altruistic donors. Uh, however, there are definite benefits to give away your code. Uh, if you give code to community, then you automatically became, become the part of the community. And if you give code on behalf of a company, then not only you as a person, but the company also becomes part of the community. And what does that mean? A community member uh, can influence the community. In any kind of discussions, the voice of the community member is more important than the voice of a non-member who simply just takes from, from the open source. So we are going to influence the development of software we are interested in two ways. We inject the code there and we are being heard by uh, the, the rest of the community. Uh, second, 
important point. Uh, once the code goes upstream, we no longer carry a burden of maintaining it. Any new change in the upstream should now pass build tests with our code, and we are not responsible for that. The others are. And this would save us a lot of time in the future. Uh, third, uh, once we open the code, we've got more eyes on it. We've got several dozen of experienced people around the world who will read our code, and if they find something wrong with it, will, they will report to us. And even if some tricky bug has sneaked through our internal reviews and through open source reviews, it can be found only by encountering, encountering it, encountering it. And once the code is running in open source, we've got a lot of free testers around the world uh, who will discover the bug for us. And actually, we want to be considered altruistic. OK. Uh, let's take a look uh, how this theory that I just described you works in the practice. What, what did we achieve relying on these strategies? The Open Connect initiative started in 2011, and there were just two developers in the team. In June 2012, the first Open Connect uh, caches, the Open Connect was announced, and the first Open Connect caches started to serve. Uh, by this date, there were three developers in team, and in the first months of the Open Connect uh, operation, the appliances were able to serve less than 10 gigabits of traffic. Uh, but the team made the goal for 30 gigabits per second uh, for the next two years, and we did achieve it. Right now, we, we, the team had grown up to 10 developers, and believe me or not, our next goal is 80. M maybe this sounds over-optimistic, but two years ago, 30 also did. Uh, what do we do? to improve the traffic through output. Uh, so, in first, we're interested in the network stack of FreeBSD because this is the, the part that we use to push the data to the client. And on the second hand, we read the data from disk, and this is the second thing we're interested in. And of course, the data flow between the network stack and the storage stack involves the operating system virtual memory subsystem. So here are the three core systems we are about uh, we, we are to, to modify. Um, a little bit technical. Uh, so what we actually already did with modern multiprocessor hardware, usually the most common performance improvement. Uh, is reducing contention on logs and on cache lines. So here I enumerated some important changes in the network stack that we did to improve its SMP friendliness. Uh, I won't go very deep into technical. Uh, so in short, what we did, we reduced the time the logs are held, uh, decoupled memory writes to the same cache line by different CPUs, uh, changed some algorithms from shared memory to per CPU copies, and so on. Anyone interested in details can ask me after the talk. Uh, some subsystems, uh, we, we did larger changes, like a rewrite of major overhaul, and this includes the kernel flow table in FreeBSD, uh, some uh, code in the Nginx around the send file call. Uh, we also converted several subsystems in FreeBSD to be multi-threaded. Like before soft updates was a single thread, now there is one thread per mount point. Uh, of course, uh, we, whenever we encounter a bug, even if the bug is not in the, our area of primary interest, it, interest, we still fix it and upstream it. So uh, there are several uh, uh, parts of software that we <coughs> modified, uh, not for performance reasons, but various different bug fixes are uh, OK. 
We also did some, a couple of complete new subsystems in FreeBSD kernel from scratch. In FreeBSD 10, uh, we introduced fast and wireless counters that store data in per CPU memory. And we achieved that without any locking, even without kernel critical section. In FreeBSD 11, uh, we already converted all network-related uh, statistics to this new facility. Right now, we are very close to releasing a complete new use and file implementation for FreeBSD. Uh, the core feature is it doesn't block on disk I.O., but actually it does disk I.O. in background. Uh, it also features uh, configurable read ahead and configurable VM caching. Uh, actually, both these features on the slide, they deserve each a uh, 30-minute talk, so I will not go into detail right now. Uh, another example uh, in the community involvement is that we not only develop our own code, but we also work together in a cooperation with other open source community members. Uh, so here's a couple of examples. Uh, when ICLON and FreeBSD Foundation sponsored the Unmapped I.O., we were the early testers of it, and uh, actually we did run the Unmapped I.O. patch uh, in production all over our CDN before it was even committed to FreeBSD. Uh, the same stuff went on when uh, EMC developed the, uh, some improvements to the uh, virtual, me virtual memory page lookup algorithm in the FreeBSD VM. Uh, and now about the things that are not yet released, but you will see probably next year or two. So we already got a new TCP congestion control algorithm. It doesn't have a cool name yet, so we call it Netflix. Uh, it already works in production, and I think that it, it will be disclosed. Right now, uh, together with the Chelsea, uh, the company that makes our interface card, network interface cards. We're working on hardware assisted TCP pacing. That means that when operating system uh, sends a TSO chunk to the interface card, it also specifies the pace at which packets should go out to prevent bursts. Uh, we already got a prototype for kernel side TLS of load. So what's that? Uh, so right now, uh, in any operating system, the send file system call cannot be combined with the SSL connection. Uh, and we are about to close this. So uh, what, what we are going to do is that Nginx does the SSL handshake uh, with, the, with the peer, and then it uploads the session keys to the socket. And after that, we can issue send file on the socket. And this will yield in uh, data being read from disk, encrypted, and sent to the socket. Uh, we are working hard on some uh, low-level improvements to the SSD drives uh, in tight cooperation with vendors uh, that will allow us to write to SSDs without any penalty on the read speed. We are brainstorming some different improvements to the virtual memory of FreeBSD. Uh, one of the topics is the multi-thread in the page daemon. Um, we also may consider investing some developer time in the proper new mass support in FreeBSD. And I'm pretty sure that this list is not full. <laughs> so oh, actually, what I'd like to sh show you that we use a different strategy on building a product on top of open source. And with a small team, we actually achieved a lot in a short period. And I think that proves that this new strategy, it works. Thank you. Uh, so the question is whether the congestion control is run on server side or on both, uh, or client and server. No, it is run only on the server side. Yeah, I know that. Uh, is it client facing or we use it internal with the server side? Uh, or 
I think that no. So uh, you know, in FreeBSD, you've got pluggable congestion control algorithms. Yeah, yeah and this is what, this actually is pluggable, and you can set a global uh, global CCTL, uh, and you can uh, configure uh, congestion control via set so opt. So what we do is that we set it via set so opt. So uh, we do it only on the HTTP sockets. I think I. Th yeah, of course, one side because the client is running on some Windows or Mac or something else. Yeah, I know, but you, you say data center, you like have we actually don't have data centers. We've got the caches spread all over the internet, uh, and uh, as you have seen on the plot, the amount of traffic stored inside, like pulling titles from a region server to the cache, it's really small, and. Uh, it, it probably runs through default FreeBSD congestion control algorithm. Because as said, we, we said this CC Netflix uh, congestion control per socket. So anytime Nginx accepts a connection, it does set so called. The clients? Uh, ah, so you mean uh, who initiates the transfer? Uh, as far as I know, uh, the cache itself pulls data. So uh, it, it uh, gets the database of titles, compares it with what, what it got, and fetches the diff. Pardon? The, the feeling? Yeah, it's here, here. No, no, no. Caches do, caches do not pull from caches. They all go to the origin server. And clients never go to origin server. Oh, actually, we do peer to peer. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm quite far from operations, so. <laughs> That's it. So, uh, sorry. What are the criteria of the ISPs uh, you select for hosting those uh, Do we select ISPs? Yes. Uh, we actually offer this uh, initiative to all ISPs, but not all accepted. We do not select them. <laughs> huh? Okay. Of course. Uh, as far as no, we don't take full routing table. There, there is no reason to do that, absolutely. Uh, we only propagate our routes through BSD. So we, we run it not to fetch the routes, but to propagate our routes. Uh, you mean there's some security implications? Uh, uh, well, we are. Uh, we hope that it will improve performance. <laughs> uh, we actually, we on, right now, we're only prototyping that. We already got some working code, but it's far from being ready. Uh, and for the security implications, yeah, probably that stuff should go through security review, of course. Do you have a library in which 
So since since the the handshake is still happening in the user land, and this is the most complicated part, and uh, we offload only the block cipher into the kernel, we will simply use the uh, kernel crypto facilities that are already there in FreeBSD. So we are not adding we are not adding new any new crypto crypto stuff into FreeBSD. It, 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 the kernel already has all, all what we need. Uh, do you consider user fees? Uh, only theoretically. <laughs> so uh, th that actually means rebuilding the entire software from scratch, everything. 